Hello and welcome to Lakeside Drive. I'm Freya Brolsma. Allegedly. It's true. I am a psychologist and motorsport podcaster, but my real job is trying to keep my fellow co-hosts on the straight and narrow, which is a task I failed at today. Thomas J. Camp is not with us for this episode. He would appear to accidentally have fallen into his own bin and he's hanging out with the mandarin, <laughs> with the mandarin that came from a long stint at the bottom of his school bag. And he's had to buddy up with Pierre Gasly in order not to not be overwhelmed by the immense stink of his own garbage. I am joined, though, by James Baldwin, whose grin can be seen from space due to the flyover at Monza, which was a full 10 hours ago. The grin, it's still going. A wine buff... <laughs> And he can do his intros off the cuff. He's got a really cute dog, but just don't call him an F1 flog. It's James Baldwin. (laughs) Welcome to this episode of Lakeside Drive, where we review the Monza Grand Prix. G'day, everyone. I'm James, and I'm joined by my friend and yours. A very brilliant intro by Freya Brolsma. Hello, Freya. I had big shoes to fill and I filled them by stumbling over my words, so you're welcome. (laughs) You just took exactly the same line as what Campy did last week. Uh, Listener, Campy (laughs) psyched himself out so much, uh, he called me during the week and said, oh, James, uh, so what about this intro? I said, mate, it was the best part of the podcast. Everybody loved it, so I want you to do a new one each week. And he went, oh, I thought you were going to say that. So he's, um, he's called in sick. Um, because he couldn't <laughs> deal with all of the pressure of last week. Um, look, Freya, just very quickly, a massive thank you to everyone who got involved with our podcast last week. There are a whole bunch of new listeners, new YouTube subscribers. Uh, hello to you, wherever you're watching or listening across the world. It is great to have your company. Uh, yes, we're missing Thomas J. Camp. He will be back. He is off on other things today. You are stuck with the very brilliant Freya Brolsma, who does not have a PhD for APRA purposes. <laughs> Uh, yeah. but, but a master's. She was <laughs> certain to get that in the last time. And me. I've spent a lot of time editing uh, a lot of Formula One podcasts uh, this last week and have a whole bunch of interesting things to think about now that Ferrari weren't as terrible as we thought they were going to be. But Freya, I think we should start right at the very beginning by uh, just acknowledging some LSD legends. And we haven't had any reviews or emails this week, but I would love to thank the many, many people who left comments on our YouTube video from the last review that we did, the Dutch Grand Prix review. Uh, An incredible, incredible amount of you all discovering us for the first time, which is great. So Abel6846, thank you to you, Joseph Hines, Mr. Carlotte, Marcus Francorium, Alice, I'm just going to read the first one. Mark Boots, thank you to you for finding us. Alex Baxter, who I went to school with. You haven't found us. You've been around for a while. Thank you, Alex. And Wheel Sports, who I did a chat with at uh, at some point last year, I think, uh, with Jason. So go and check out his channel, Wheel Sports, too, if you want a different opinion on everything. Um, It is so great to have so many of you around. Uh, But Freya, what I think we should do is this is now your segment, is go into our Discord comment of the week. And now it's time for the Discord comment of the week. There were several to choose between this week, and I'm actually struggling to select one, which is why I've put together a short list. Mm. And look, I think the one which actually came through you know, after after the um, Grand Prix had finished, but I think it just reflects how a lot of us are feeling, which was, morning, anyone else dream the Dutch anthem last night? <laughs> and it's just, it's one of those things which I think really reflects how we feel when we wake up in the morning, which was, has mm. that just become the anthem of my life? And <laughs> the answer is quite possibly, um, at least for the next 18 months, I would say. Mm. I haven't stopped <laughs> so singing Issy, the Dutch thank anthem. You, for such a long he, time since the last time. Just ridiculous. Yeah. She sings an anthem. Me, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Although I have to say, and I can say this, mm. it reminds me a little bit of the 12 days of Christmas. Oh, yeah? Okay, so next time you listen to the Dutch Grand Prix, put mm. on 12 days of Christmas. da 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 Yeah, trust me, they're the same. I'm a musical talent. Just Fray's also obviously. Dutch, by the way, if anyone's listening who's uh, I- <laughs> who thinks, who's this Australian having a crack at my anthem? She's having a crack at her own anthem. 
I'll have a crack at all the anthems. That's okay. Um, Fair enough. They, uh, but yeah, it, it just always gives me little throwbacks there. But thank you, Issy, for that comment. It uh, ref- reflects how we all we all feel at the moment. <laughs> you have so let's let's mention these shortlist comments because they're also equally very good. Yeah, there was one which again was a, probably a very close um, second for me because of the relatability, which was oh boy. Tomorrow, Tina is not going to be thanking today, Tina, for staying up for this race. And that was kind of immediately after the Yuki's not going to start realisation oh. and mm. after they had jinxed the Grand Prix by saying it was all going to be done in 75 minutes and then somebody pulled over before the race had even started, uh, that promptly uh allowed for Tina to come in with that little gold one. We also had, (laughs) so this (laughs) context for this one was that I was getting a bit frustrated with the broadcast because we weren't seeing much from kind of ninth place downwards. Now, fair, there was lots of activity above that. But what had happened, I was looking at my screen, Stroll was in like 19th position Ferrari, 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 Red Bull, Red Bull, Red Bull, bit of McLaren, Ferrari. And then I looked up and Stroll was in 13th. And I was like, when did that happen? I didn't get to see it. What's going on? To which Ross replied, Stroll is the money that falls into the couch that you forget about. <laughs> <laughs> it's money. That's correct. Uh, yep. And then there was one more, which is a very Australian reference. And we do apologise to those who are on the Discord who are not Australian and sometimes perhaps have to just check to see they know what's going on. And in this Grand Prix, due to the new suits that were being worn by Carlos and Charles, there were a lot of comparison to the four and 20 pies <laughs> packaging, um, which is alarmingly similar. So there was a lot of pie chat in the uh, the Discord <laughs> today. And so for some people, particularly the Americans, which that probably means pizza, which is you know, potentially equally relevant this weekend. It was a bit confusing, didn't really know what was going on. However, so with that with that context, Cargan Diaz says, waiting for the team four and twenty to make a twelve stop strategy and for the Tifosi to go on a riot after the race. Which, you know, looked like it was going to happen for a minute there. <laughs> yeah, uh, our resident garbologist, uh, Cargon Diaz, thank you to you for being involved. Hey, thank you to everyone being involved on the Discord server over the course of the race. So many of you uh, being involved is so brilliant. Uh, and we have some legends specifically to pick out for this week, Freya. Mine is Tilly Willy 13 who is currently recovering from some surgery, so is able to watch the race live because he's banking in a lot of sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but this is the special shout out that everyone was thinking, Lewis, you dumbass! Because it's true. You attack an Australian, you immediately go in the bin. If you were the best driver of all time, Lewis Hamilton, you are now very, very, very far behind Fernando Alonso and Max Verstappen, as far as I'm concerned. Especially in case there was any question. Ted yep. Gravitz comes on and goes, oh, well, Piastri's. You know, shaking his head because he knew he wasted that opportunity in saying that Piastri caused the collision. Ted, shut up, you unbelievably British biased man. I can't, I just cannot deal with it anymore. Put Damon back on the track. At least he gets it. (laughs) Well, exactly. In the classic check the scoreboard kind of moment, now we can look at the penalty to see where the fault of that really did lie. My Discord legend of the week actually goes to a three year old. Now, to be clear, the three year old is actually not on Discord. It is her mm. auntie who is uh, a bit of a celebrity in our Discord group, Hillary. But the reason why Hillary's niece is my legend of the week is because when watching the Monza Grand Prix, th- she did the following things. One, hissed at the TV every time she saw Lando Norris. <laughs> I just, which if it was socially acceptable, I might also do. Mm. Um, The next one was really just enjoyed saying Fernando Alonso's name. Me Mm. too. Who doesn't? Three-year-old niece. Mm. It's a beautiful name. The next one was just kept shouting, why, at the TV when Yuki couldn't start. (laughs) We share that question with you. He was doing the same. Yeah, exactly. Yuki was also screaming the same question. And when Hillary said, well, actually, it's the engineers that need to go now take a look at the car, she just said, who are the engineers? Oh. Like, great question. <laughs> if you want your she, three-year-old questions answered. 
She also enjoyed that the tyres, like her, also had blankies, which is about the most adorable thing I've ever heard, and had many, many questions about what aerodynamicists do. You and me both. So for all of those just little nuggets of gold, Hillary, your three-year-old niece, she's my Discord legend of the week. <laughs> well, thank you, Hillary, for passing on all of the, those details to us as well. If you'd like to get involved with the Discord, you can find the link in the description or just go to our website, lakesidedrive.com.au and click the community button. <laughs> It is time for Tommy T's television broadcast review. And I tell you what, you're absolutely right with your introduction. I was like, here comes the flyover. I can feel it. I can feel the flyover coming. There is, can't see anything in the distance yet. That's a good thing. And the tenor standing on the right-hand side had a power stance going on. He had one <laughs> foot in front of the other, ready to go, ready to get all of his passion out compared to the other two who were standing square. And uh, look, I actually glimpsed Freya. I glimpsed the aircraft. I went, oh, no, too soon, too early. No, no. Just millisecond perfect crossing the finish line just as the crescendo happened. Probably the best time on target flyover Formula One has ever experienced. 14,000 out of 10 for that flyover by the Italians there. Absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal to watch. And to tell you just how great that timing was, if you go to Ruth Buscombe's uh, Instagram, so I see she's a strategist over at Alfa Romeo, she, <laughs> she said... We should hire whoever timed that to the anthem to do the F1 quality timings instead of me. <laughs> so I think that that uh, tells you just how much they really nailed that uh, nailed that timing. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. Frey, let's talk very quickly about the broadcast. You did mention it earlier that uh, we didn't see much of really Lewis Hamilton onwards. Uh, fair enough too. It's probably the first time in a very long time we've had a lot of action up the front towards, um, well, for considering two teams actually battling for position and battling themselves. Uh, it was a bit annoying, though, because I would have loved personally to see a lot more of Liam Lawson. From what I could see based on his timing uh, and positions up and down the pack, it looked like he was having a really good Grand Prix. And geez, it would have been great for him to at least score a point for the entire team on, on debut. But for me personally, I, it's hard to to be negative about that at the same time because I really loved seeing Carlos on Leclerc crime going on. Yeah, and I don't disagree with that necessarily. But then also, and to be fair, she's probably got all sorts of different uh, ways of watching that we might not have access to. But imagine if you're Leon Lawson's mum and you're like, mm. I'm just going to settle in and watch my son's second ever, you know, Formula One race and, oh, I didn't see him on the screen at all. So, it's. I agree in that there was plenty of on-track action to justify the airtime that it was getting um, on the broadcast, but it is frustrating. And for the people who are more invested in those drivers or those teams, it's frustrating. And you kind of, especially when you are seeing the names just flick over and around and everything else, I'm like, what's going on down there? There's obviously a battle. Um, I don't think they've pitted because it hasn't, you know, hasn't it's a, hasn't dropped far enough or. So it was a tricky one. I do agree that it was justified, but it's just a bit frustrating when you don't when you don't know what's going on. Um, is is where I get a little bit annoyed by not having that type of coverage. But just on the um, the anthem side of things as well, though, I just there's something about the Italian passion that I just adore. There's that just. You know, everyone's, they, a lot of them took their hats off and their hands on their heart while they're playing the anthem, and it just seems to be a really genuine and raw feeling that they have towards the country and the music and everything else. And I think like we see that in some other places, but it just comes from a deeper level, I think, with Italy. And I certainly, won, for one, love watching that. Well, it was great to watch. Uh, what is your score out of 10 for the broadcast this weekend? Because it didn't have synchronised flags it can't really go higher than Zandvoort, so I'm going to go with an 8.5. Mm, yeah, I'm giving it an 8. Uh, I still, as much as everyone talks about Monza being, you know, the Tifosi and everything else, I still get the feeling that the Netherlands probably had a little more vibe to it. And that's probably yep. because Max Verstappen was absolutely dominating and they all knew <laughs> that he was going to dominate again this weekend. Uh, well, that's uh, Tommy T's television broadcast review done and dusted. 
Freya, let's just have a quick look back <laughs> on our prediction predicaments. <laughs> it is a predicament because all of us... That's an appropriate alliteration. <laughs> all of us. Goodness me. I thought Williams, in in creating a special rear wing, the only team to do a specific rear wing for Monza, and fair enough too, this is the, probably the best result they were going to get in the entire season, were going to be much kinder on their tyres. Turns out, no. Uh, Campy's front row prediction was Verstappen and Albon. Um, mm, nope. Mm. Uh, his podium, though, Verstappen, mm, Hamilton, mm, Albon, mm. 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 Sonoda, 10th. <laughs> mm, absolutely not. Uh, Frey, yours. That's the second time I've fact because he put DR the other he did. way. He did. Yes. Stop putting. Anyway, um, Freya, your front row was Piastri and Albon. Oh. Um, also, which is also mine, can I just say? So both of us yeah. idiots. Uh, oh, well, me, an idiot. You, not so good. Oh, um, for your podium, you had Verstappen, Alonso, Albon, 10th Ocon. Uh, my podium was Verstappen, Piastri, <laughs> Albon, 10th Lawson. Uh, again, maybe uh, let's consider properly, let's take some time ahead of the next Grand Prix when we do our preview next week to properly think about the data rather than going full emotional <laughs> based but, on Well, sure, else. but like, okay, but sure, but 10th. Me saying 10th for Ocon is not an irrational call. That's actually something that seemed pretty likely at this venue, but I didn't know he was going to retire. Like <laughs> no. it's, And uh, Campy did not know that Yuki was not going to start. I'm just concerned for the drivers that we are somewhat jinxed. Mm. Um, Podcast is pox, as Michael oh, Aminata likes to call it. Uh, there's no commentator's curse. Uh, and I think that's exactly what's happened, unfortunately, <laughs> for these drivers. All right, let's talk about all of them, shall we? Let's go through now, Freya, a full team-by-team team analysis. We're going to start at the very back of the pack, which is an annoying consistency I'm finding with this team. Haas, mm. well, they just every time have a great first stint and then tyre degradation is way too high. Um, falling right off the very back of the pack. Hulkenberg had a pretty okay qualifying Freya, 13th. K-Mag did not, 19th. They ended up finishing the race 17th and 18th, which is the last two cars on the grid for this weekend. This is a team that really just needs to change the way they do things. But sort of going off a little bit what I was saying last week, it seems, you know, a little bit silly now to me that they are still a team that buys parts from another team. Back when they started, when Williams was flailing around and Marussia were going under and Manor and all those kinds of other things, it made more sense to, to save money and everything else. But surely at this point, they need to be looking at someone like Andretti and Cadillac who are building a factory specifically for this purpose and thinking to themselves, maybe we should just put our US lot in and start doing this going with just isn't working anymore. If we have the podcasters pox, they have the Haas hope in that at the start of the race, we are all <laughs> thinking this is going to be the one. We're going to get some points, maybe both of them. Even. Oh, no. Oh, oh no. Oh, no. De no, definitely. Oh, yeah, no, definitely not. And it just kind of we gradually just fall into this dismal pit of doom um, mm. as the race progresses and the season progresses as well because that does it's not just in the race, it's in the season as a whole. They tend to start off but then you realise that they're not going to have those big jumps that the bigger teams seem to to have. And like you said, they really do need to look inwards now because, like you said, it worked for a while, it made sense for a while, it's not working or making sense anymore and I think they've got to really decide who they want to be in the sport. You know, are they – content being back markers come the middle of the season and I just struggle to believe that anyone who's investing the amount of money that they are in this sport is happy to say that. Now, of course, they're never going to say that out loud, but there is an acknowledgement in terms of the limits of your success that has to come with that and then questions need to be asked. And so I think there is that absolute kind of inward looking, who do we want to be in this sport and what changes do we need to make in order to get there? You can't just keep replicating the same processes, um, the same relationships and that type of thing. And we're not going to see a big change with the potential in the drivers next year, which means it's got to come with the car. And beyond that, it needs to be probably a pretty big, you know, fundamental adjustment to make a significant change to their to their standings. 
Yeah, Haas have confirmed now both Kevin Magnussen and Nico Hockenberg will be driving for them for next year. Look, it's very easy to say, come on, you need to just build a factory and get on with it. Obviously, it takes a lot of time. Just ask Aston Martin and the project yeah. that they had there. But it really does need a change in philosophy, mainly because... I think everyone loves this team. When mm. K-Mac got his pole position in Brazil last year, I don't yep. think there was a single person who was upset by that fact. So, Haas, we just want to talk about you further up the grid more often than not. Let's talk about Alpine now. Whoa, from the highs of a podium to the lows of why did we bother turning up this weekend, 17th and 18th for Gasly and Ocon in qualifying and 16th for, Ocon, uh, for Gasly, I should say, in the race and a DNF for Ocon. This really is a tale of absolute highs and absolute disaster, Freya, for this outfit. It just, like, like I said, calling in 10th for them it was a very rational idea because <laughs> they could have a really good weekend. They could have a terrible one. It seems to be a complete dichotomy for them at the moment. So I'll just go smack bang in the middle. Although really, I think maybe what we need to be doing is predicting them either third and fourth or 17th and 18th <laughs> or just, no, no, they're not even going to start this race or maybe they, they won't finish it has been a real up and down season for them. I think it's, it must be so tough as the drivers though because there's so many things that are outside of their control and they just mm. really seem to have had so much of that this season, obviously with the DNFs in particular. And I think Gasly as well had a funny pit stop, like they couldn't get the car jacked up as well and that type of thing. There was a comment on the Discord actually about that saying that the uh, the RP team are going to be doing dips for the rest of the week, which I think <laughs> is probably pretty accurate. <laughs> when they come back and they're all going to be absolute muscle men, just like absolutely oh. enormous, um, even though I'm sure that's not the reason, uh, lack of strength in the person who does that job. But, yeah, there's some consistency that they need there that they need there, and that's not just in the the driving and obviously what's going on, but as an organization, they seem to be in flux very considerably at the moment. And whilst I don't think that's going to have a direct flow on effect to performance, there there is very likely to be an indirect um, you know relationship between the stability and safety and consistency that everybody feels in their work and in their environment. And how that plays out in their, the work that they're doing, you know. Like mm. I said, I don't think it's one of those A equals B things, but it, it's pretty hard to suggest that they're not related at all. Um, so I think it's a, a team that, much like Haas, <laughs> who do you want to be? Make some decisions, um, make some adjustments and, and help the team to feel settled. Yeah, frustrating for, for both Gasly and Ocon, mm. especially Gasly because he left the Red Bull family. Of course, he was probably never going back to the top team, but... He was probably hoping for something a little bit more from, from this team, considering they are yeah. a manufacturer, and they are an absolute state of disarray. How good that Fernando Alonso left, how good uh, that Piastri didn't go anywhere near it, and Daniel Ricciardo didn't get into mm. that other seat, because it's going to be very hard, I think, for both of these drivers to be able to show any kind of pace consistently for other teams to be interested in them. This is really now probably a long-haul French project for both of these drivers to get this team going but without a team principle confirmed because we're very hard as we both mm. know leadership is incredibly important in this sport um fred Vasseur's feeling pretty okay at the moment i would imagine but he would have specifically been feeling a hell of a lot of pressure after the departure of mattia bonotto at ferrari last year so for this team for this outfit especially with these power units and and they say said that i mean look monza is a very specific type of circuit very high speed sure. Very low downforce. The engines are frozen until 2026, as in no development can be made in that. They are saying that the Renault is down on power compared to everyone else. Well, here's your proof. This is absolutely yeah. what it looks like in that respect. Alpha Tauri doing pretty well, it has to be said. Uh, Liam Lawson doing incredibly well to hang on to the back of his teammate for qualifying. Lawson 12th, Sonoda 11th. Uh, Lawson finishing the race in 13th, Sonoda not even starting the race. Such a shame because we know Alpha Tauri, this is their home circuit and it's also where they've had their two successes um, in this sport. But let's just talk about Yuki Sonoda very quickly and where you think he's at because Daniel, he's had three teammates now. Daniel Ricciardo came in and he learned quite a lot from him and now Liam Lawson's there. They used to race junior formulas together, um, especially back in New Zealand. They've come through together. If you've seen Drive to Survive, they used to live in the same flat in Milton Keynes before Yuki moved out uh, to Italy. So there's a lot of history there between these two drivers but the person who has the most to lose in this situation is Yuki Tsunoda. 
It's an interesting one, right? I think he's he obviously had a really kind of tough start to his career and we were all questioning whether or not he was justified for his next contract. Even he said that. He said, I was quite surprised that they gave it to me, which was pretty indicative as to, you know, understanding that that's what everybody else thought as well. He also shared um, that that experience. And what we've then had is him and a teammate that – you know, they've kind of been on par with each other. I don't think he's had someone who's really challenged him. You know, if there's anyone who's going to do that in the near future, it's going to be Daniel Ricciardo. But you have to wonder if, you know, so no, if Lawson's shown up and he's in 13th, you know, again, not fair, fair comparison because Yuki wasn't in the race, but it does suggest that while we've been saying things like Yuki's really outperforming that car or Yuki's really able to get a lot more out of this because, you know, for whatever reason, has he? Or has he just not had competitive teammates like Nick DeVries? And so what we're getting looks like an outperforming individual but actually is mediocre individual we'll probably find out towards the end of the year when we if we start seeing some performances from Daniel Ricciardo but we've talked about getting the best out of a driver by having a teammate that really challenges you and I think that's something that Yuki has really lacked to be entirely honest I know him Pierre Pierre were fine but again is that someone who's really pushing him pushing him to be better pushing him to um, develop the car to be able to provide better feedback to the engineers and he said that that's something he learns a lot from Daniel Ricciardo and others Um, but I think he really needs to be up alongside somebody who's really going to push him so that we can see what he can really do because there is something that makes me feel like there's potential there but I, I really don't think we've seen it yet and I if he's getting equally if not you know equal performance out of someone who's only in their kind of second race he doesn't have that long really to to prove himself so I think he's really up in the air at the moment to be honest. I think probably what we'll see if Daniel Ricciardo ends up moving to Red Bull Racing, which I still think, despite Sergio Perez's performance today, I still think is probably more likely than not uh, for, for 2024. I believe that this is probably the driver pairing we'll see in Alpha Tauri. I think Lawson's now done mm. enough for probably Helmut Marco and for Christian Horner to say, right, well, let's bring you, you know, finish up your Super Formula career, um, providing, of course, that Daniel Ricciardo is able to, to return to Formula One this year. S- finish up your Super Formula career, hopefully get into first for, for that and just come across to Formula One because I think he deserves it. I, he, you know, he acted for Daniel Ricciardo and Daniel Ricciardo's return, driving the Red Bull around Bathurst and <laughs> along the bridge in Wollongong and all kinds of amazing places. So he's obviously committed to the brand to be able to do something like that. He's also been able to come in with such a cool, calm, collected head. He was very, very complimentary of both Yuki Tsunoda and Daniel Ricciardo. Apparently, Daniel just saying, mate, whatever you need from me to have a successful time out, just ask. Like, whatever I can do to help that, you know. And I think this is a great team that has shown some development this year as well, Freya, from being a woeful. They're still last in the uh, Constructors' Championship in 10th with three points, all scored by Yuki Tsunoda. But results like this, especially qualifying 11th and 12th, which is, you know, 12th again for Lawson, who second weekend in the car, the first weekend was an absolute write-off for him, basically because of the pressure, the circuit type and everything else. At least he knows Monza uh, a lot better than Zantfort. I think it's a good sort of couple of steps, and it probably maybe restores a little bit of faith in the Red Bull Junior program if they do bring him in next year. Now, of course, this is all depending on where Sergio Perez and Daniel Ricciardo go for next year. Of course, Sergio is contracted, Daniel is not. But I personally, I think, would love to see Liam in the sport full-time. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think it would be a great pairing and... All of that is true, uh, particularly as it relates to the the Red Bull Junior Driver Program. I think that's very up in the air at the moment because the way it currently looks is that they like feed them up, let them have one race, go, well, oh, well, you couldn't handle it, back down you go, and then they go and bring somebody else in externally anyway. So why would I put myself through that when they have a bit of a habit of bringing people in too soon? Is my thought, but and I agree. So I agree with all of that. I think the one thing is where does that leave Yuki? Because while sure he's you know, doing fine in that car, he's still left without that really senior kind of figure that's pushing him 
And I just don't know if he's going to get that from the people around him in in Aftari either. So I just I think he needs a bit more guidance and pushing than what he's getting at the moment. Yeah. Well, um, one of the other podcasts that I edit, doesn't matter which one it is, but uh, <laughs> one of the comments that they made about a specific Williams episode was that, and I said this last week very briefly, that Yuki Tsunoda and Alex Albon would be a great Williams pairing. I yep. think Albon is the kind of driver to bring out the best in Yuki. And I say that because he's already done it. When Albon was reserve driver for Red Bull Racing, when he lost his full-time seat, one of the things that he was tasked with doing was helping Yuki Tsunoda. And I think that's why we saw one of the biggest turnarounds in Yuki's character yep. on track. I think he is a well... Uh, rounded driver. Is he the fastest driver on the grid? Absolutely not. Can he be? Probably not either. But he's going to be one of those really good, you know, strong leaders of a mid-pack team like a Nico Hülkenberg probably for the rest of his career. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? He's still one of the fastest 20 drivers, 19 drivers if you remove Lance Stroll. One of the fastest 19 drivers <laughs> in the world. And I will remove Lance Stroll from, from that. Let's keep going, Freya. Let's talk about yeah. Alfa Romeo because, firstly, oh, what a livery. Please, goodness, keep that yeah, livery for the rest beautiful. of the season. Your cherry ripe is out and your yeah. beautiful Bellissimo Italian flag is in. Agreed. Completely agreed. I love this. I loved it so much more than the cherry ripe. I thought it was beautiful. It looked great on track. Great from just from concept to execution. Absolutely loved the livery. And points for Bottas. Yes. I, just, I hate how excited I am for him to get one point. Get but it in feels there, like Valtteri. it's been so long. You can't say that, James, unless you tell me where you're talking about. I demand a pin to get drop. Into the you're gonna say, get, get into the points. Get into the points, Valtteri. <laughs> That made me far too excited for our honorary Australian to get mm. into the points finally. But um, it just it feels like it's been a long time since we've been able to say anything positive um, about them really. And it's not so much that it's all, you know, terrible stuff, but it's just there doesn't seem to be that um, kind of spark. And we've talked about them being kind of in no man's land at the moment, which, again, you just wonder the impact of that on what they're able to produce on track, but that was a nice kind of cherry on top of the not no longer cherry ripe. Where am I going with this? But uh, but I was yeah very pleased for him. Well, I love this team. I really do. Uh, hilariously enough, the last time Sergio Perez was on a podium in Monza was uh, nine years ago with Sauber. So... The fact it, this is a team that has been so strong in the past, same as Williams, mm. I suppose, and there is, of course, a pathway now for them to get back to that position with Audi in the future. I don't think there's anything to not like about this team. The the two drivers are brilliant. I think Joe Guan Yu is probably pretty underrated. He was probably pretty underrated coming into the series. A lot of the conversation, of course, with how much money he brings from his Chinese backing, all that sort of stuff faded away pretty quickly, I think, because when it came to it, to have... Valtteri Bottas there as the lead driver to learn from him, also to have Valtteri to help develop the team. They have had so many disappointing outcomes for a lot of Grand Prix for the last two years. They're currently ninth with 10 points. Haas are ahead of them by one point. It doesn't feel indicative to me of, of the differing in pace, but considering they're both Ferrari customer teams, that is still disappointing probably from a power unit point of view. But these yep. two drivers are great. I really just think that they deserve more. Uh, now, Joe isn't uh, contracted for next year. Valtteri is. Joe's not. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in that space. You mentioned last week that you think he will stay, which, you know, thinking sort of more about the Carlos Sainz to Audi rumours, I think Carlos Sainz will use that to force Ferrari's hand to, you know, improve the offer probably a little bit more than, uh, than anything else. Uh, so... Maybe he does stay there, which wouldn't be such a bad thing because let's remember at the beginning of this new set of regulations uh, for Alfa Romeo, they did pretty well pretty early on. It's unfortunate, though, that everyone else has seems to have developed the cars around them and they've lost out in that respect. And one of the things, remember, when um, Valtteri went to Alfa was talking about being in a team that size you know, that everything's just smaller in terms of your production capabilities, the speed at which you're able to respond to ideas and development and that type of thing and having that real um, kind of <laughs> kind of confronting what he was going to be working with for the rest of the season and saying, oh, okay, right, this is, this is what we're working with basically. And I think there's an acknowledgement there of the best you can do with what you've got. And they're one of those teams where 
you know, it's very easy to look at their performance on paper and say it's not good enough because, you know, it, it hasn't been an inspiring season for them. It hasn't been for some time, as you mentioned. Um, but is this the best they can do with what they've got? And those two drivers are just giving it all every weekend and and this is where they are at as a team. We And also every someone has to fill that role. Like every, every team can't be a Mercedes and a Red Bull. We need those middle kind of middle pack uh, teams and that type of thing. But I think you've got to acknowledge when you're looking at these types of organisations, just what they're working with in comparison to Mercedes, Red Bull, Ferrari. It is not going to be a pinch of the you know infrastructure and size and support and everything else. And so, you know, I think they're doing a great job with what they've got. I think they're doing a great job with strategy for the most part. Um, occasionally with tyres, you know, there's some interesting decisions, but for the most part their strategy seems to be pretty on point as well. So, like, it's not – it's just frustrating because you just wish that that would translate more to points because we just really love both of these drivers as well. Aston Martin, not a great weekend for them, Freya, but I did – Listen to the High Performance Podcast with Fernando Alonso. Listener, if you've not done that, do yourself a favour, go and do it because it is a very raw chat. Uh, I think the questions were brilliant, I have to say. Not not often do I think interview questions are very good on podcasts, but that was really, really phenomenal. Just to get into his mindset too of, of things and knowing that he's enjoying Formula One a lot more being back in the sport after the break, mm. which I think we probably, Daniel Ricciardo would say something very similar about that too. An okay weekend for Fernando. Tenth for Quali, ninth, good good haul of points there, considering what was going up towards the front of the pack with uh, at least the first four spots occupied by Red Bull and Ferrari. But realistically, this is a team that is still held single-handedly by one man, one man, the champion, Fernando Alonso, uh, who's, who's still got... who's the best Formula One driver he thinks he's ever been currently. And I think he's probably right because to be able to extract such pace out of the car, to be able to have such brilliant communication with the team, to hear that he speaks with his strategists and engineers four or five times before the Grand Prix to lock in strategies, to to use an army term, and actions on plan as to if this happens, then this happens. If this happens, mm. then we'll do this. If And to, to lock that in his mind so that... You're right. When we do listen to you, Fernando, we think that you're making that up on the spot. No, you've just you've <laughs> buried that information into your head and then pulled the visor and absolutely gone for it. But this is a team that is so ridiculously one-sided, it beggars belief that there is not a conversation about replacing Lance Stroll for next year. I, I will be really disappointed, not angry, just disappointed if they, uh, if they don't because we're talking about your Liam Lawson's. Um, we are talking about all dri- other drivers who probably deserve to be on the grid and you've got Stroll qualifying in 20th. Was it like, And I, I just look at that and I go, was there a reason for it? I think now I think someone did say that he was struggling with the car or something on Saturday. But hmm. Well, there were <laughs> – I will just flag this. So, Felipe Drogovic did FP1. Yep. His car broke down in FP2. So, he his first time in the car was FP3 yep. ahead of Quali. So, we will give him slight benefit of the doubt in the fact that he missed a whole day's worth of racing uh, around Monza on the Friday. But – Formula One drivers should be able to get together with their cars a lot faster than that, surely. You would think so. And, again, we're not just looking at Saturday of this weekend. We're looking at the season as a whole. And imagine what it would be like if his teammate was not Fernando Alonso, right? So imagine if we had someone who was a little bit more mediocre and they were only within a couple of places of each other every weekend. We'd be like, well, there's not that much of a difference between them. They're probably getting the most out of the car that they can, blah, blah, blah. But now we've got someone in the car who is able to extract so much more out of the car, out of the people around him and promote it to be better, that it's really just showing him up. And as I've said, I think I've said this on the podcast before, I am willing to cut him some slack because I think he gets a really hard time being a paid driver. Like you said, Joe got it as well when he first came into the sport. Look at all of that Chinese money. But it, he shook it pretty quickly by showing that he des- he deserves his spot and he performed really well in his, his rookie year and this, that and the other. We are now starting to question that about Stroll and it's not about saying, well, you know, you're only here because of money. It's like, well, 
be better. (laughs) You know, go and speak to Alonzo. Like, what are you doing that I'm not? And maybe Mm. that is happening and we don't know. But like you said, I would I would be really disappointed because I think there with the performances that he's been given in comparison to his teammate, you look at the numbers. This is not a an emotional argument. This is numbers on a page. And you you have to be questioning that. You have yeah. to be. Anyone else would. If it was Red Bull, he'd be gone already. Yeah. Look, we don't know what it's like to be in a Formula One car. We also don't know what it's like being in Aston Martin. He's probably putting a heap of pressure on himself. But the reality is this is a top-tier sport with plenty of other drivers, Felipe Dragovic included, who is the Aston Martin reserve driver, Mm -hmm. who probably would have a better time under Fernando Alonso to learn from Fernando Alonso than currently is happening. And at the end of the day... The board for Aston Martin will be looking at this situation and looking at the points. The fact of the matter is points mean prizes when it comes to the Constructors' Championship. And as much as no one cares about it, can be, yes, okay, fair enough, (laughs) there are people who do. And Ferrari have just overtaken Aston Martin for points. So Ferrari have been rubbish for most of this year. Um, Aston Martin are fourth with 217 points. Ferrari third with 228 points. And out of those 217 points, Fernando Alonso has 170 of them. It is yep. just ridiculous. The We know that this driver in Lance Stroll has performed in the past. He's put some great performances in Williams and in the pink Mercedes. There has been times where he has shown his brilliance. Back in the day when I first season the podcast, it was one in six races Lance Stroll showed his absolute skill. Now I think it's just really disappointing for for Aston Martin and for fans. Aston Martin are gaining fans all around the world, and rightly so. It's a brilliant brand. They make beautiful cars. What Lawrence Stroll has done with that brand, love him or hate him, has been phenomenal. Now, has it been phenomenal because he developed this team for his son to race in? Well, potentially the case. But unfortunately, if the son isn't up to scratch, points made prizes, and the board will want to have something changed relatively soon, I wager. (laughs) Yeah, and just really quickly on Aston Martin as well in terms of their involvement with Formula One. As a result of their involvement in F1, Aston Martin has sold three, somewhere between three and 400 Vantage F1 edition cars, which has generated an additional 60 to $80 million in sale. And they have that has a price tag of like, you know, they're like £160,000. So you think mm. about that in, that in terms of revenue. They had over 6,400 units that were sold. Like it's yeah. just their involvement with the sport. I think it's really interesting. We're going, why, you know, why are businesses looking at F1 in particular as that that business partnership? And just thinking about that in terms of the revenue opportunity and the involvement in the sport, the performance has to be there as well at some point because they're just, you know, that's and that but that's coming from the safety car more than anything. <laughs> like that's contributing yeah. as much to their um to their their profits as a result of being in the sport, but it doesn't look good for a business like that to then have someone who's performing at this level. So at some point, I think this is just the complex situation of this though, where you've got a family run, family run business, which is a multi-billion dollar organization, but you know, you've got um, Lawrence Stroll at the head, but a business decision has to be made here. And when you look at the numbers and if you treated them like anything else, there would be a pretty obvious outcome, but we might not see it because hashtag nepotism. We're going to take a quick ad break. We'll be back very shortly. Well, a massive thank you to our sponsor for this episode, NordVPN. Now, if you want to be Christy Lawson watching Liam Lawson, that's his mum, watching Liam Lawson's live footage and you need to press the red button but you can't in New Zealand, you probably need to get yourself a VPN and the fastest VPN on the market is NordVPN. They've got a special deal right now. If you go get a two-year plan, you can get four months absolutely free. And NordVPN just isn't a VPN. They offer a stack of different services, including password protection and data encryption, all over your devices. I've got my VPN on my phone, on my laptop, iPad, and whenever I travel, I'm always ensured to be connected and keeping all of my stuff safe. So... Thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this episode. Do yourself a favour. We use this already, all of us. Even Tommy T uses it and he's no longer part of the podcast. Go to nordvpn.com forward slash lakesidedrive right now to get your two years plus four months 
free. So your plan is heavily reduced. Of course, there's a 30 day money back guarantee if you're not happy with it, but why wouldn't you be happy with it? We've absolutely loved using NordVPN and partnering with them for this season. All right, let's keep going, Freya. Let's talk about McLaren, a, a team that we thought were gonna be a lot higher up the grid than they were this year. Um, Unfortunately, a little bit of argy-bargy between the drivers, uh, which we can talk about in just a little bit, but Piastri qualified ahead of his teammate, Lando Norris. Piastri 7th, Norris ninth. That's a good sign for Piastri, of course. Let's not forget, in the greatest Italian Grand Prix of all time, when Daniel Ricciardo won Formula 1, Oscar Piastri won Formula 2. So it was a double-dipping double, double dipping Aussie delight then. Uh, and unfortunately for the race, though, 12th, he did get fastest lap, um, and Norris in eighth. Uh, I think Piastri had a pretty tidy race. Freya just couldn't extract the pace out of that car, uh, especially without a DRS uh, advantage like the like Lando behind him. But look, I think probably from a halfway over halfway point of the season for Piastri, he's well and truly secured his place in this sport. Oh, without a doubt. Absolutely, without a doubt. Not even Nico Rosberg can question the Australians, <laughs> you know, presence in this sport and deserve to be there. There is absolutely no doubt that he has made a mark well and truly um, and we, you know, haven't even finished his first season. And that just speaks to a really uh, raw ability, I think, because it's it's one thing to – for people to be talking about it, and then to just to jump in a car is just obviously his first year at McLaren, as we're talking about. To be able to have those types of performance as quickly as he has, especially after they had the upgrades and we saw that leap in performance, he did not get left behind. So I think that just shows just how talented he is and that raw ability. So, and I, you know, when you have these races like today, which was a tricky one for him, it's very easy for us to get pretty downbeat pretty quickly because we're so invested in his success as we are with Daniel Ricciardo. But then you just look to him and his future and you just go, you just have so much ahead of you. You've shown the potential that you have and not just that, but you know, ability now. And as he matures, as he learns more from race engineers, different race engineers that he works with, different team principals, other colleagues and has mentorship, he's just going to get even better. So that's what I try and think about when we have races like this, which are disappointing um, for, for him and, and for us, is you just go, just look to think about the future. There's a bigger picture here. He has really established himself and he, that helps to get you excited again. <laughs> there was a lot to be happy about, though, I think, for Oscar. The first opening lap, getting past Albon in a much yep. faster Williams, of course, Albon then getting back past him again. But just the way he's able to place the car, I think, is is really impressive. Lando Norris had an okay race, I think. You know, again, he probably won't be very stoked with the amount of points that he got this weekend. But considering where McLaren were at the beginning of this year, not such a bad result. Uh, he was held up by Oscar probably for a little bit, although I think if the cars were reversed, same... Well, in fact, they were. When the cars were reversed, Oscar was right behind Lando. So that kind of conversation about holding up is probably nonsense. Um, and just trying to defend from a world champ, a seven-time world champion behind Mercedes who just wanted to get past desperately. Yep. Um, impressive for both of them to, to defend for as long as they did for Lewis. For sure. Can I just say how absolutely wrecked Piastri looked after yeah. that race as well, though? It was obviously really hot there, and they talked about that during the broadcast quite a bit. But it was just – you have some races where they come out and they look – you can tell they're race, but they look pretty fresh and, you mm. know, they're just chatting away. He was catching his breath a bit. He was really sweaty. He looked absolutely exhausted. And I was like that – you just – it's a quick reminder as to the physicality of some of these tracks in particular. Obviously, we're about to go to Singapore where we'll see that again. We add that humidity um, to the environment. And, yeah, I just I really noticed that, not just with PS3. It's probably who I noticed it the most with, but with some of the others as well. They just looked exhausted. So I think it just reminds you. And the other one was Alex Albon, and he was working so hard. We'll get to Williams in a minute. But, um, yeah, no, lots, lots to be positive about as well. I think that incident with, um, with Hamilton as well, like you can see how it happens, unfortunately, and, when, and Hamilton, to be fair, completely owned it and said, you know, that, that was 
my bad. I was looking, you're looking into the corner. I didn't see him there, this, that, and the other. And he went over and apologized. And as soon as Piastri received that and he acknowledged what happened, he moved on from it again, just Mm. showing that he is the absolute professional that he is. So lots to be excited about. Williams, Logan Sargent. He got got out of Q3. That was very exciting for him. He, in fact, set a purple sector uh, going into Q2, which was very exciting for him, but then wasn't able to get it together. 15th qualified compared to his teammate in Alex Albon, who qualified 6th. Um, Sargent ended up finishing just outside the points in 11th, Albon in 7th. Albon, just absolutely the master of defending. Uh, As I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, Freya, Williams just seemed to be chewing up their tyres a lot harder than everybody else. This is a very, very tough track to to maintain tyres. It's not like Australia where you can race all bar one lap (laughs) on the same set of tyres, although he does do that. But fantastic, though, result for Williams to be 7th in a Grand Prix, This is where they really want to be and where we all want them to be, especially Alex Alex Albon. For Alex Albon, and so somebody raised raised this on the Discord during the race, was saying that uh, he and Perez basically were on equal footing when it comes to qualifying, which I did not realise. It's one of those stats that kind of creeps up on you towards the middle or end of a season. But, yeah, currently, you know, Perez is only two up after he qualified higher this weekend. Albon is absolutely killing it in that car. Like you said, tyres this weekend were were obviously much, much trickier. And, again, just seeing how he came out after the race, he was absolutely exhausted. He worked so hard to keep that position that he did. And I think we kind of hoped that he would be in sixth and he maybe did have that in him. But he worked bloody hard for seventh (laughs) um for sergeant i just i want to start seeing him out of q1 consistently like i want to see him making it into q2 i think that would show that he is starting to develop and it's a feels like a reasonable ask you know i think it's very there's a big gap between q2 and q3 and i think just starting to consistently make his way out of q1 would be a really kind of evident um step that feels realistic for him as well um and hopefully you start seeing him on the cusp of the points a bit more more frequently but for now i just want to see him get that qualifying right yeah one of the things i think is now different to williams compared to where they were before i wonder if valtteri bottas maybe had a bit of a thought like "Mm, maybe i should have gone to williams rather than alfa romeo although he did come from Williams to go to Mercedes so sometimes it's hard to go back but just to Mm. see this level of progress now that we've you know we've got rid of all of the pay problems and the pay drivers are no longer there Alex Albon is a strong driver noting that this is an open seat for next year I think it's probably a little bit more attractive than the other open seats going around the grid so to talk about Williams on this side of the ad break too is really really exciting and I think with a with good leadership like we're seeing with James Vowles at the helm it makes a big difference because the culture of that team looks pretty pretty good, Freya. Yeah, I completely agree, except that Valtteri couldn't possibly have gone there because then we would be hearing, Valtteri, it's James, <laughs> again, and that we, that couldn't happen. I think his nightmares might have just Valtteri, stopped. Valtteri, it's James, well done. You're doing a great job. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah. Don't I mean, You don't need to. I just wanted to compliment you. And, yeah, you're right. He would have entered into this different dimension of just flashbacks of Lewis Hamilton being Feels like he's uh, in a different reality. Him. Yeah, that's it's right. Like a let's, different reality. Let's talk about Lewis Hamilton, Mercedes. Uh, George Russell qualified in fourth. Really good qualifying for for him. And Lewis Hamilton qualifying in eighth. Uh, they both received five second penalties. Um, Lewis ended up finishing in sixth. George finishing in fifth. Honestly, considering everyone else up ahead of them for this weekend, not a bad result for Mercedes. Um, Toto looks tired though, don't you think? He's not. He's not as is. Not that I would say he was useful exuberance beforehand, but he <laughs> probably just the the joy, this you know sense of joy being as as dominant as they were. He looks tired. They've just announced both of these drivers will be with them for the next two years, so it puts to bed any speculation about Hamilton going anywhere. Um, maybe that's not such a great thing for George Russell, considering he probably would have liked to have taken over the reins from Lewis Hamilton at some point within the period uh, that he's now contracted to, but. Again, fifth and sixth, a good haul of points for Mercedes. Again, it's it's allowed them to jump up um, considerably now further ahead of Ferrari. So Mercedes, 273 points, Ferrari, 228, and Aston Martin, 217. Rebel Racing are on 5 billion points, so there's no point talking <laughs> about them. Uh, but Mercedes, 
you know, it's it's a tale of again, it's a tale of two stories depending on the racetrack. Sometimes they can go really well and sometimes it can be absolutely terrible for them. They don't seem to have figured out those consistencies yet, have they? Like you said, mm. with um similarly with, with Alpine, they seem to have these these big up big ups and downs and I think where they are seeing points and good points it, there's probably a lot about the driver to be said um for those situations i think it will be really interesting to be george with now knowing that lewis has extended because as much as he can and he has to be fair exert his dominance a little bit more in terms of saying no i don't want to be on the kind of second strategy the alternate strategy and not be getting preference or whatever it might be I just think as long as you have that world champion alongside you, it's very hard to shake the Junior Berger um, feeling. So I think whilst I'm sure he has a lot to learn from him still, I think it's something that he would just struggle with because he's just he's always going to be in his shadow. That is just a hierarchy. That is nothing he can do about. And he just has to let his performance speak for itself for sure. Did you know that George Russell's middle name is William? <laughs> No, and I have absolutely so, zero care about that too. His name is George William Russell, which I just think well, is you want amazing. Him to have a last name? Oh, well, Alo, we're going to give you last name Smith, George Smith Russell. But, so I didn't know this, and then somehow it came up, and then I learned that it really was public in like August last year, and that led to all of these memes being like George Russell is the type of guy to have three first names, <laughs> and people saying I didn't realize you could be sponsored from birth, and. I, Go back to like August last year oh, when this, course. for I some reason, <laughs> hit the media. <laughs> and I feel like someone who's recommending like the West Wing right now. I'm like, I learned about this amazing show. Go back, you know, 20 years. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's a great show, I learned though. that and it really, really made me laugh. He is the type of guy to have three first names. And maybe he can use those three first names to try and get an advantage on his seven time world champion uh, teammate. But look, this weekend was, look, that was the best they could do. And they worked for those places. George Russell kind of just had his own little race in the middle of nowhere. He kind of had a couple of moments there. But Really, he was just trying to hold position, I think. Um, Hamilton had to work pretty hard for, for that sixth and I'll forgive him because of how he responded after the collision with Oscar um, as to, you know, how much we hold that grudge. He handled it professionally, so it's all right. You're not in the bin. Let's talk about Ferrari. They had an incredible qualifying, an incredible qualifying. Carlos Sainz first, Charles Leclerc in third. And uh, I said, yeah, but there's been no strategy or pit stops involved so far. So the one lap pace is good. Great. Let's see what happens in the race. Third and fourth. Now, I think the biggest surprise here is Sergio Perez managed to get up into second. Uh, Well done to him. But for the last lap, goodness me, talk about tussling for I'm the number one driver at Ferrari. It was... For my mind, incredibly reckless what Charles Leclerc was doing and I think a little unnecessary. It would have been the most Ferrari thing ever for them to take each other out at the last, you know, going into the last lap at turn one and have George Russell come up onto the podium somehow. Um, You know, it just would have... I just... I was standing up shouting at television, Charles, for goodness sake, stop it, because I really wanted Ferrari at least to have one spot on the podium. And I think... Carlos Sainz was so dominant all the way through practice, qualifying the race. He deserved to be on that podium more so than Charles Leclerc. Um, maybe now the favour, you know, I talk a little bit about who's the preferential first driver at Ferrari. Have they got one? Maybe now that's a little harder to, to have that conversation because this performance by Sainz was incredible and I'm very, very pleased for him, Freya. I'm relieved for him. Yeah. <laughs> I I am I am relieved for him. If he had not been on the podium at the very least, it would have been absolutely shattering. And I think he is very much pulled into question that number one driver um kind of allocation. And I don't you know what I really liked seeing them race. I really mm. liked that they were racing. I do think they probably pushed it a little bit too close. Like I was on the ab- absolute edge of my seat yelling as well. And you just wonder if they yeah, needed to go that hard perhaps. But then at the same time, they both want it. You know, they both wanted to be the Ferrari driver on the podium at Monza. So try telling somebody in that moment not to go for it. And if they've been told to not take risks but you are racing, that's 
maybe that was a limit. And, you know, we're kind of looking at it saying that, look, that felt reckless, but maybe they knew where their limit was and that's exactly what they found. So I liked that they were allowed to race. I think that's good for teammates, to be entirely honest. I think it's pro- it can probably be problematic if they know that an order is always going to come through and, well, I would have been faster than you, but they made a swap or they told me to back off. You're always going to have that sense of what could have been. Whereas when they're allowed to race fair and square without crashing, um, that's when they can, they can say, you know, no, you were, the, you were the better driver today. And somehow Leclerc still managed to shout a bit about whether or not Signs was actually faster, but you've just got to say, mate, congratulate him and be glad that one of you is up there. Yeah, look, Stoke for Ferrari, is, uh, as much as we love to laugh at them on this podcast, as Campy often says, Formula One isn't Formula One without Ferrari. Carlos Sainz, we love as a driver. Charles Leclerc, we love as a driver. And, um, you know, Charles has so much potential. But I think what we saw at the end is that when he gets frustrated, he overdrives the car and that lock up yep. into one on the last lap is that in action. You, you yep. could physically see it, it was, uh, was no good. But anyway, that's fine. They managed to get around okay. And uh, look, I think for Ferrari should be happy with that because the the, the defending the color signs did against Max Verstappen it was simply phenomenal. brilliant. Simply, simply yep. brilliant. Because as soon as Verstappen was passed, it was see you later. He's about seven years up the road yet again. So for, for that side, I think it's fantastic. Let's talk about Red Bull very quickly to wrap this one up. Uh, Max Verstappen, of course, qualifying in second, finishing in first. No surprises. Perez qualifying in fifth, finishing in second. Surprises. This is a driver under pressure, Freya. We know that, of course, with Danny Rick not competing in this round, it's probably a little less pressure than he's experiencing before the summer break. But realistically, this is a race that, well, as we know, this is a racetrack where Helmut Marco makes decisions about things. This is where mm-hmm. Nick DeVries got his drive from last year at Monza. So maybe Liam Lawson in the same position can get the drive secured too. But for Sergio Perez, this is where he should be all the time. I think the point now is the consistency. Can he put it where he needs to? He he did drive incredibly well, I think, considering Carlos is probably a little cheeky not leaving maybe all of the room that he should have done going into one. Not that I'm so upset about that because, again, I think Carlos is doing a phenomenal job defending. But, again, good for Perez, a good little boost for Perez because we don't like to hate on him. We don't. He's a love, he's a fantastic guy. We absolutely celebrated his retention in the sport to Red Bull um, at the end of when he got booted out of Racing Point. So it's a good thing for them. But Max Verstappen. And now in a league of his own, Freya, in total dominance, how much can this continue going on into the future? Let's not even talk about this season. Can it continue to, for the 2026 regulations? Well, I think that's the thing, right, is that we're now looking beyond 2023 and because of where they're at with their car now, and I think one of the drivers actually made this point a little while ago, they could kind of stop worrying about this year and divert their attention quite early into 2024 because they just they don't have to you know continue to fight for constructors points here and there in the third and fourth whatever it might be so you know they kind of already have a head start on next year because of their performance this year i think we will see it dominate into next year because at least at the start of the season partially because you'll see some people probably try and adopt some of their concepts but not quite know how they work I think you'll see at the start of next year a lot of um, evidence of a of a Red Bull car perhaps imprinted on the the side of a Ferrari but at the same time it doesn't make it, it doesn't work like that in that they have to actually understand how those components work together and how to maximize the performance for any of those design ideas or design concepts and so I think we'll probably see them because I know how their cars work they know how their car works when they've got an issue they figure it out Adrian Newey is a genius he's a once in a lifetime mm. kind of brain when it comes to what he what he does and so I, I wouldn't mind betting that it really does continue until the middle of next year and you might see that somebody comes up with an upgrade in the middle of 2024 season that helps them to find the pace, but then Red Bull still have Max, right? And he has shown and we've seen other drivers look at his onboards just going, 
how do you put your car hmm. there? And that, that's a combination of things, right? That's a combination of him trusting that the car is going to, like knowing the grip that he's going to have, knowing how it's going to come through, through a corner. And you might have others who would say, I would just never do that because it I won't survive. Yeah. You know, yeah. will not come through that corner. So, you know, it's not, it's not just a matter of the car, as we've seen with Perez. Perez is an interesting one, right? Like if you – if we take the Australian bias out of it, what you're left with with Perez is an inconsistent season but brilliant when he is in the game or in the zone. And so I don't think you can disregard those great performances that he has. I think better off understand the inconsistent weekends to see what's going on there so that you can try and get somebody who – is at his best all the time so that you always have him right behind Red Bull, right behind Verstappen if he's unable to beat him, which he kind of sees for the most part, he's he's not. So like, it's interesting. If I was Red Bull, I'd say, you know, you've, you've got someone here who when they're on, they're really fantastic and we just need to understand what's getting in the way of that. Well, we're going to a street circuit next. It's why he likes to operate in Singapore. So maybe Max Verstappen's podium or at the top step of the podium run will come to an end under Sergio Perez at a street circuit we will see that is a team by team analysis done and dusted Freya who is your driver of the day it was a big toss up between Carlos Sainz's hair and Alex Albon <laughs> because they were both excellent both during and after the race apparently um but I have to go for signs. I think his defending for the first kind of 10 laps or so was very impressive. Um, we haven't seen someone kind of battle with Max for that long in quite some time. I found it was very impressive. And then he held off Charles as well. So it has to, it has to go to signs with his very, very hardworking locks. Yeah, mine's Alex Albon just for being able to hold on to the positions that he did. Uh, of course, giving Williams a massive boost in points too was great. But uh, it's hard to go past Carlos Sainz hair. I will give you that. Okay, it's time for our fantasy team name competition for the Italian Grand Prix. First was the Monza Curse, although it didn't happen this time. He, uh, This person had signs, Piastri, Albon, Alonso, and two times of Stappen with 271 points. Second was <laughs> Big, Rig, Big Rick Energy with a three for the E. Well done. And third is Danny's fucking hand, spelt <laughs> in a way that gets around... <laughs> Lots of creative spelling for swear words. Yeah. It's the most I've ever seen in this. Uh, some of the word, some of the team names rather that I've found, and thank you to you if you've updated it. Um, broken Monza Carpel, <laughs> which is uh, very, very good. Red <laughs> flares to Fossi Beanies. Campy Bot, yes, from Discord, has finally entered the uh, competition. Right. Um, order, order. <laughs> Restored with a capital D and R in order. Very good. Um, Attenzione, sad to Fossi. Yes, well, not as sad as probably they thought they were going to be. Um, look, I'm going to just read the first bit of this. Fred Masseurs, <laughs> and then insert name of uh, Aston Martin team principal, um, bring back McGinley, which is clearly someone who listens to Box of Neutrals. Uh, if you enjoyed Peter McGinley being back on that podcast, not talking about Formula One, um, good for you, I suppose. It was, uh, it was quite hilarious. I got sent some of the behind-the-scenes stuff going on from Rob. Very, very funny. Um Change to something funny. Team name. Yes, that's always a classic to go to. <laughs> and the prophet has spoken. But he hasn't because he's not here. Self-proclaimed in every single way. But look, that's it. Thank you so much for listening or for watching this Italian race review episode. Next week, next Monday, will the F1 prophet be back? Who knows? But we will be back, though, to talk about the Singapore Grand Prix. A preview back into the correct side of the world, Freya, in Singapore. It's always such a brilliant, brilliant race to go and a brilliant track. I'm going to find out what time it is going to be on in my time zone. Just it's a rubbish time for here. It's for rubbish one, to hear. It's eleven second. o'clock. It's the same. It's the same time as the Italian Grand Prix, the Singapore Grand Prix. If you're watching it here in Australia, oh no, the race is at ten p.m. So it's an hour earlier than where we came from from the Italian Grand Prix. Oh, it's at seven a.m. here. It's really not too bad. <laughs> 
If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a rating or review. We read all of the reviews on Apple Podcasts and thank you to you if you've done one of those recently or left us a rating in the mobile app on Spotify. And thank you again to all of our brilliant YouTube viewers for leaving comments and to the many of you who have subscribed. Uh, if we can get to a thousand subscribers on YouTube this year, that will be absolutely mind-blowing. Um, it's been brilliant to talk with you, Freya. Thank you so much for dissecting the Italian Grand Prix. We will be back next week as we preview the Singapore Grand Prix. See you then.